Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you guys know me. I'm Kay Wright, your CEO of the Air Force Aid Society. And I am absolutely honored to have with us today a very dear friend of mine and uh, someone that I've done quite a bit of work with uh, in a few different arenas that we'll talk about today. Uh, her name is Harriet Dominique, and Harriet is the uh, Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, as well as Corporate Social Responsibility Officer for USAA. Uh, I think I got that right, and if I didn't, I, Harriet will uh, help, me, help me with that here in just a second. Uh, she has been a, a true friend to not only Air Force A Society, but the Air Force in general prior to taking on this role with our team. Uh, of course, I was in the Air Force and Harriet and I and her team worked together on quite a few initiatives. Uh, one of the major initiatives was financial readiness for our airmen and their families. Uh, so not only has she supported the Air Force Aid Society, but airmen in general, but again, uh, she's been an amazing person and amazing friend. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to our show, Harriet Dominique. <laughs> well, what a pleasure uh, and actually a, a privilege and honor to be here today uh, with you, my friend, and inspiration. And I first want to acknowledge that um, as I'm here with you today, and I know we'll have some conversation back and forth, I hope, about my experience and your experience, but I get to, the privilege of representing our, our USAA CEO, Wayne Peacock, and being a voice for 36,000 employees, Chief Wright, that are so laser focused on taking care of military families through the work we do at USAA. And so with that, I must first thank you for the friendship, your inspiration, and all you've done in service to our nation and continue to do in service to military families. So thank you. And that crazy long title that you guys, I, I get it wrong most times myself, but <laughs> <laughs> truly what it represents is about 32 years uh, working with USAA. And I know you must be shocked because I'm only 35, yeah. but 32 years <laughs> serving as an employee. And I, and I can tell you more about that and, and how that started. Yeah, so so speaking of the title, you know, before we go too too uh, far back, uh, maybe let's start because you know for the for most of our time together, I knew you as the um, corporate social responsibility uh, director or or president, um, and then within the last year or so, I believe, then you took you also took on the role of DE and I. So you know, for I guess my first question is, how did you come into that role? What, uh, how did you either decide, or how did someone decide that that was the right role for you? Okay, so I I will cover that. But are you okay with if I just start with how I started at USAA and then how I am in this role today? May Absolutely. I give a little bit? Perfect. Thank you. So I, I started at USAA in 1989. Uh, fresh out of college. In fact, it was my real job out of college and uh, my first real job out of college. And I started entry level, a member service representative answering calls in our contact center. And Chief Wright, that was the perfect role for me to start with USAA because number one, it allowed me to understand the business and our mission and fall in love with our mission and the service that we get to do. And it also helped me learn and understand military families, their sacrifice to their nation, and all that we could and should do for military families through USAA. So that's why I love starting in the contact center. And over my 32 years, I've had the opportunity to relocate about six times, physically move, to most of our USAA campuses, and I've worked in multiple divisions. And in about 19, I'm sorry, in 2013, that's when I took on the role of uh, uh, head of corporate responsibility and president of both of our foundations. And that's when I got to meet you as we were working the Ed Foundation and what that could and should be together. And we formed USAA's corporate social responsibility strategy, which is focused on military family resiliency. 
and you're spot on. About uh, a year ago, we had a CEO change and our CEO, Wayne Peacock, about uh, eight months ago, asked if I would add Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer to my portfolio because he's a visionary and he's so committed to military families. And he knew that there could be an incredible synergy with corporate social responsibility and the work that we do in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that's the journey that we're on, integrating these great functions to better serve military families and to help the communities in which we live and serve. Wow. I, I think, you know, uh, most people, when they see someone like yourself or someone like me, at the point in their careers and they believe that uh, sometimes, you know, we were born su successful, but like you mentioned, you know, you started off in the, in the call center. What would you say uh, have been the keys to your success that allowed you to get from where you started in 1989? And oh, by the way, I joined the Air Force in 1989. Uh, so we started kind of our, our journeys together and uh, I'm glad they actually converged to uh, our careers converged when they did. But what, what would you say have been the key, your keys to success when it comes to, you know, longevity and, you know, um, how you've been able to move up the ladder of USAA? Yeah. And so I, I appreciate uh, how you start that, that uh, people like us, and I'm wondering what that could be referencing. Uh, maybe your audience has or has not noticed, but both of us are African-Americans mm -hmm. and we both, uh, to be transparent, um, wrestle with the challenges of what that means to be a minority in our nation and in corporate America and in the military. Mm -hmm. So I want you to know that after I answer this question, I'm going to ask you the same because I think that folks always want uh, that advice. So I'll tell you that it's uh, two primary uh uh, things that I've done in my career. Um, number one, I have always been, and sometimes I don't like to admit it, this type A individual that's always trying to do better than the best. So that best performer in the room, how can I be even better? And if the boss is asking for 10, how do I deliver 20? So I'm always trying to be the best in the room and growing up, Chief Wright, my parents let me know that as an African-American female, that would be the standard. So how am I always the best working harder than anyone else? And then number two, while you are achieving what you're achieving, how do you take care of others and give to others? And that giving to others does come back to you tenfold. I'm going to share my very favorite leadership book. I think that you know this, The Go-Giver. And this book is uh, the principle of karma and how when you take care of others, it comes back to you tenfold. So I would say making sure you work harder than everyone else, being your very best, and then go giving your way to success. I know it sounds simple, but that truly is what res resonates and is my reality. So may I ask you, sir, what about you? My goodness, the 18th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. Wow. And now you're the CEO of the Air Force Aid Society and just a beautiful spirit and so kind. How did you achieve your success? Yeah. So, you know, first, let me say, um, if you had any idea, once you presented me, uh, when I came to the USAA's campus and you presented me with my first copy of uh, The Go-Giver, how many people I have passed that book along to either physically the same way that you did uh, for me or uh, through some type of reference when people ask me, hey, what's, what's uh, you know, your, your favorite books? And, and it's just been amazing. And then, I, of course, I went on to uh, to read the, the other uh, three to four books in the, in the series as well. So uh, I wholeheartedly agree on that part, that I've spent the majority of my career uh, giving back and helping others. And I, and I, and I, I'd, I'd have to, to say that that has been a, 
a really important part of my success is helping to build others. And then uh, just sitting, being able to sit back and watch as their success kind of comes to fruition and receiving emails and note cards and things, uh, you know, saying thank you. Sometimes for people that I've actually never even met and, and they talk about how inspirational. But, but much like you, I think I learned, I had decided at some point in my career, this was probably midway through my career, that uh, you know, my greatest competition was me. And I, and I said, I'm going to outwork the guy in the mirror every single day, uh, practicing those same principles of how can I be 10, 20, 30, 100 times better, not just in everybody, better than just everybody in the room, but better than I was yesterday. And so I learned that incremental uh, what incremental success means. And like you, you know, I was taught not only by my parents, but by my teachers and by, you know, the, the, the young men and women who came this way before me that, hey, man, because you're African-American, you got to be 10 times better than everyone else. And those are the same things that I had to teach my two sons and my, and my daughter, you know, fair or not. Um, that's just the way of, of, of this world. And, and uh, you know, I think both you and I work as hard as we do on this issue of DE&I so that someday that won't have to be the case. But uh, so, again, you know, just just like you, it's, it's was all about um, being the very, very best uh, that I can be. Um, giving back to others. And then I would, I would say, Harriet, the third thing that, that has been helpful for me was, you know, Jim Rohn says, uh, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And, and so I always try to surround myself with positive people, with people who had aspirations, with people who could be honest with me and give me feedback and, and tell me about myself when I needed to be, <laughs> needed to be told, but who also were supportive of, of me and my journey. Um, you know, during it all throughout my career. And I, and I try to do that. Hence, you know, our friendship and, and uh, our ability to continue to, I think, not just help our communities and help our organizations, but to continue to inspire each other. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that point. The third point that you said that truly, um, and, uh, and, and thank you for reinforcing that, Go giving, working hard, but oh wow, having that sponsor or that mentor or that inter or that that person that has the courage and cares enough for you to say, don't do that again. Uh, that you know that really isn't a good look uh, when we sometimes can, um, with professional immaturity, maybe lose our way. So I want to say again, thank you to you and to all those mentors and people who believed in me even when. I didn't and don't believe in myself, you know, sometimes having the imposter syndrome. Yeah. So uh, it really does take those, uh, the, the village, as they say, yeah. to help folks be successful. You know, let's, let's, let's jump back to DE&I because you and I have done some work um, collectively with uh, USAA and with Blue Star Families. And every, every time you and I talk, one of the things we agree upon is that uh, conversations surrounding uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, needs to be tough enough and, and painful enough to get people, you know, moving in a right to, to get people to take action, but not so painful that it drives people away and it drives people into a shell. And so I'm wondering, you know, since you've been in a role, you know, what is your assessment? Have we had the right conversations at the right level with the right amount of pain to drive action? So I would say, and I'll focus first on USAA and then I'll focus on, on my peers. And so at, at USAA, we are beginning to have those conversations at the, at the highest level of our company to include our board, our CEO, and our executive council. And we host uh, chat sessions. In fact, like one you and Kathy Roth, like you and Kathy Roth were engaged in, and we call those sessions Get Real. And that is the opportunity to talk about experiences that you have based on your demographic or your experiences that help others understand what takes place 
for individuals that maybe they haven't walked in their shoes and that conversation can help create empathy. And with that empathy comes connection. That connection can help mitigate unconscious bias. And then that creates an environment where individuals have a sense of belonging. And with that belonging, people can truly be themselves and help USA improve. So again, those conversations have started at the highest levels of our company. And we wanna make sure that every leader and every employee goes to that place that is uncomfortable, uncomfortable enough to drive change and helps to create connection. Now we haven't got it perfect and we are in this journey, but people are embracing it and craving more of it. Externally, I have the same engagement with my peers, and we know that whether it's nonprofits that are focusing on their diversity, including who they serve, or corporations, that truly the first step is storytelling. And though it may seem so simple, it truly is crucial to bring about, about understanding. And I know we talk about the uh, uncomfortable conversations. There are more steps that a, a corporation, a nonprofit, even the military uh, needs to take. But thank you for starting with your, and then that's your, your uh, guidance, just uncomfortable enough to spark awareness. And, and that is truly a powerful and critical first step. Yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree um, you know, that those conversations have to be uncomfortable enough to, you know, get people to take some actionable steps. But I also worry sometimes, Harriet, to be honest about um, for the military, for nonprofits and for corporations that um, the, the talk just ends up pacifying the, the folks that are really impacted, the, the minorities um, the folks of different religions, the folks from the LGBTQ plus community and and how how soon we get to action, I think, is important because the while while I, I understand we can't fix this, we didn't get here overnight and we can't fix it overnight. Um, it, it waiting seems um, is difficult for if you're a female, if you're a minority, if you're from the LGBT community, or if you're, you know, Muslim or some other religion that's 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 not in the majority, um, it's it it seems tough. Like, hey, I've been waiting for years. I've always waited, and 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 I hear a lot of talking. Um, when are we going to see some some action? And so, you know, one of the things that I love about um, USAA is that you guys are taking action, that you guys are driving towards solutions and starting to make a difference uh, in this particular arena. Yeah, and so I'm so glad that you um, you started with the conversation because without that spark, there is not full appreciation or understanding, but the conversation is just the beginning. And what we're doing at USAA and this is the recommendation, is approach DE&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion, just as you do any other business imperative. At USAA, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a strategic business imperative, meaning that it's going to be interwoven into all we do, impacting all stakeholders, our employees, our members, and our communities. So first, it needs to be aligned to your business purpose and to be a strategic business imperative. It's not a nice to have on the side. As with all business imperatives and strategies, your second step is to have a strategic plan, an operational execution plan that has measurement or visibility of progress and accountability for that progress. So that is step two. And then lastly, change management and communication for your workforce and your stakeholders so that they understand the why. There are so many studies that show that it is good for business to have strong DE&I. So in addition to being the right thing to do, it is better for business 
And who doesn't want to have better business results? And lastly, for USAA, we're about to celebrate our 100th anniversary in 2022, 100 years of serving military families. And we believe that representing the diversity in the military community with our workforce, our products, and our services and communications is going to be a foundational step to ensure relevance for the next 100 years. So the conversation, I agree, agree Chief Wright, is so important. Keep those conversations, that back it up with business sensibility and actions that ensure change and effectiveness. Yeah, I, you know, I was gonna add, one of my questions was gonna be, hey, what, what would you recommend for a, a new DNI, you know, director or person on, on how to structure their programs, but you laid it out perfectly for, for them. So we'll make sure uh, that we get this footage to them so they can understand and, and I'll maybe even have them reach out to you uh, for any additional assistance. Now, let me, let me ask you this, Harry. This is something that people ask me all the time. And, and frankly, uh, you know, I've struggled with, you know, through, throughout my career. So you are, you are already in a, uh, a major role with the USAA Ed Foundation and, and managing the corporate uh, social responsibility. And I mean, and just the, the fantastic work you were doing across the, all, all the services. And then you add this <laughs> another um, equally, maybe even more important role uh, to your plate? How do you do it? How do you balance it all? And I, and I know, um, you know, you're a, um, uh, a family woman. Uh, I've had an opportunity, Tanya and I have had an opportunity to sit down and have dinner with, with you and Robert. Uh, but, but how do you do it? How do you make time for you, for Rob and, and both jobs along with probably any other thing that, <laughs> that Wayne and, and the USAA team has you doing? Uh, so um, I am a workaholic. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm being transparent, yeah. and I've always loved the privilege of what I do. And I use those words, um, privilege and service, purposefully. So I'm so fortunate to have a family and a husband, Robert, and we need to have dinner with you and Tanya again soon, mm -hmm. but who's so supportive of my career aspirations. And he loves what I do because he knows the mission and purpose. So I will, if I may be transparent, I know that I'm not balanced, but it's okay because <laughs> I love what I do. And then the other point that you made when you mentioned Wayne, our CEO in the team, the only reason that I'm able to do this and do this well as I have this amazing, dedicated team that does all the heavy lifting and I try to stay out of their way. And so a key is to surround yourself with folks that are smarter than you, that are the positivity and the drive to fulfill the mission. And so it's my team like Justin and, and uh, Dan who's retired, but David, and we have Tia on the team. And then my DE and I team members supported by the highest level of leadership, Wayne Peacock and our board. And then I must mention my peers, the leaders that are around the company. We are truly 36,000 employees strong, committed to this. And so how I do it is because I have this incredible team of peers and teammates that make this successful and that are committed. Wow. I love it. And I, I think I could um, definitely say the same thing about, uh, uh, co of course, my current team now with Air Force Aid Society and my, my previous team, who I'm actually having dinner with uh, this evening, uh, my team that I um, spent time with when I was in the Air Force. Um, many, many times I encounter and provide coaching and mentorship for uh, young minority uh, females. And um, I, I wondered if you could help us and maybe help them with how to, how to move forward on your worst day, on that day where you're just struggling, either you don't feel like it or um, you don't get an opportunity and you feel like maybe it's because you're a female or because you're a minority or something happens in a family. But on that, that worst day, I mean, what do you fall back on? Uh, on the days and, you know, you're a superwoman, so you may not have the days where you want to quit, but 
most of us have those days where we wake up and just like, man, you know, I, I, I just can't do it anymore. If, if you ever have those types of days, like how do you, what do you draw upon to, to keep moving forward? Yeah. And so this is, this is a great question. And just to be clear, and I think it's already fully evident to anybody that's listening in and those that know me, I am definitely a mere mortal. <laughs> and actually, you're the one with the cape and the tights and the boots, sir. But as a mere mortal, yes, I have those days. And to be even uh, more transparent, as a mere mortal who routinely re uh, wrestles with the imposter syndrome and a um, sometimes a, a insecurity uh, about, am I good enough for this role? I do have those days. And uh, I'll tell you um, if it if it be able to fit in how I started and in the prayers that I have with my mom and you've given me permission to to be myself. Absolutely. So on those worst days, um, I'm so blessed to still have my mom and dad. And my mom is a prayer warrior and she raised us with strong faith. And so what she'll say is that um, our maker, a higher power, uh, the Lord has you in this role and he gives you the strength and the wisdom to do what you do. So please let him work through you and stop thinking that you're in control of all of this, Harriet. <laughs> so uh, my mom is truly my greatest inspiration and she is the one that will give me a big old hug and a kiss on the cheek and a kick in the pants when I need it. And uh, she helps me know that uh, there is um, strength in, in, in my faith. And then on those days, Chief Wright, when I'm just feeling so down, um, and this really works for me, it's usually when I've really been focused on myself. You know, oh, woe is me, oh this, oh that, and focusing on the worst of the situation. And then what I do is just think about the, the positive, uh, the times that um, have gone well, when I did succeed, when somebody was in my corner, and reinforce positive affirmation because mindset does matter. And then of course, reaching out to dear and trusted friends and advisors that give advice and comfort when you have those days. And one, and then this might sound a little corny, but one thing that I've learned in my 32 year career, and yes, I am 35, but my 32 year <laughs> career <laughs> is that those times when it's the worst, whether it's the worst boss or the worst and hardest assignment, those are the times that you have the growth spurt and helps you grow and learn and mature and build character. Because if it's always just this easy road and you don't have those times, it really does diminish your ability to grow and persevere. I know it's hard when you're in it, but I truly am grateful for those hardest times because they've helped me be prepared for where I am today. Does, does that make sense? Man, you preaching. I, you, I need to get you one of them, one of them towels and you can wipe your forehead off and, and start, <laughs> and we need an organ and, and everything. Cause I mean, that really resonates, I think certainly with me and hopefully with a lot of people. Um, the part that you, that, that you, that you mentioned about, it's so hard to recognize when you're in it, though. And, you know, I was uh, I was just talking to a young man yesterday and, and he was going through a little something. And I and I told him, hey, man, this is I, I, I sent him a smile emoji and said, hey, this is good for you. And I know right now you're cursing me out saying I don't I don't care about none of your fancy, you know, leadership talks and all that. I'm struggling here. And I told him, you know, you'll look back on this experience and you'll appreciate it. And I, and I know it's hard now. And uh, so to hear hear you say that I think is really, really important and will be inspiring to a lot of people because you're right. We need those hard times. We need those, those tough times. One of the things that I've, uh, I think I learned to do, you know, over the years as well, when, when I, when I don't feel like it, when I'm having a tough time for, for whatever reason. Uh, and, and like you said, we all, we all go through it. Uh, I, I always think about the people that we serve. 
I always think, you know, while I might not feel like it, while I might be going through a troubling times, there's lots of people out there depending on me to get my butt out of the bed and and do what, you know, uh, I, my, what I've been destined uh, to do uh, or ordained to do, however you, however you want to say it. And, and that really helps me. That really helps me keep things in the perspective. Very similar to what you talked about, where I take the focus off of me. Right. Regardless of what's going on with me personally, professionally, physically, mentally. And I try to focus on uh, the people that we serve. And that, that helps me get out of my funk and, and keep moving forward. So. Yeah. <laughs> you preach, too, sir. <laughs> <laughs> now, now tell me, you, I, you, you already admitted that you you may not be as balanced as you would like, but. Now, what do you what what do you guys do for fun? Like, how do you when you're not working on B and I or helping you know people financially and and all the other things that you do for uh, USAA? What, what what do you do to have fun? So my favorite times are truly uh, with my husband, and uh, he is such a blessing in my life and my mom and dad, and just spending time with family. And what's so great. As you know, when, you, when you're growing up, uh, and again, I know it's a blessing that I have both mom and dad. When you're growing up, mom and dad are, are your parents, you know, the, uh, the uh, authority, the, uh, you know, taking care of the family. But now that they're, I see them as adults, my dad is hilarious. He's such a character. He's so funny. I didn't know he was that funny and just, uh, you know, taking care of them and hanging out with them. I believe that that downtime with family and friends really, that is my, um, that's my happy place. And then I'm, I'm also a, a big reader. I, I'm, my husband's like, are you reading another book? You know, I'm a big reader. And so that, that makes me happy and then travel, which we haven't been able to travel, but truly the best time is when I'm talking with my mom and dad and hanging with my, my family. Yeah. What about, uh, so what's on your reading list these days? You got anything, uh, anything good? The thing that I'm reading now, believe it or not, is anything dealing with DEI. <laughs> and so I'm reading a lot of articles and little snippets and podcasts all around diversity, equity, inclusion. And um, I've not picked up a, a book of fiction uh, lately. There's a great uh, Harvard Business Review if anybody's wanting to um well, I don't look at me getting all into it, but there's a wonderful Harvard Business Review by Dr. Livingston on promoting racial equity at work. It's fantastic. Okay. So I would recommend, uh, and let me make sure I'm saying the gentleman's name right, Dr. Robert Livingston from Harvard. Really powerful. Okay. I'll, I'll check that out. You know, we we at Air Force A Society, uh, as you mentioned, uh, DE and I, again, are um, we didn't we didn't have a, a diversity, equity and inclusion strategy or officer. And we just recently brought one on uh, <clears throat> within the last year. And, and so we've we've been more intentional and purposeful about um, diversity, equity and inclusion, not only for our staff. You know, we have a relatively small staff, but making sure that the programs that we execute that USAA helps us, um, you know, execute the, that they're inclusive and that the recipients of our scholarships and our assistance uh, are diverse. And, and so we've pledged to do a much better job and really be more purposeful and intentional um, with respect to DEI. And so again, thank you uh, for leading the way and setting such a good example. And thank you for being such a, uh, an avid supporter of, of us. Um, I mean, you guys have been the diamond uh, sponsor for our charity ball for years, which is actually where we first met. It was probably four, maybe five years ago at the charity ball at the, <clears throat> I believe it was at the Gaylord uh, right. up here in, in, in uh, the National Harbor in, in the DMV. But, uh, and, 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 and that's just a small portion, right? You know, most people know us from our, our charity ball, but USAA, um, the, the money that you've given us and just in the last year, uh, two and a half million dollars for the COVID relief and, and allowed us to do so many things for so many families. It's just, it's just, uh, amazing. So again, let me, let me say thank you. 
And well, I want to say thank you uh, to you, uh, Chief Wright, and the work that you do. And I love the way that you positioned the point that you just made. So what I heard you say is that you are purposeful in your charitable and philanthropic uh, approach uh, for military families to um, have eyes wide open on the diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. So whether it is the dollars from USAA or any other uh, airmen that gives or corporation, you ensure that there is that balance and that purposeful equity. And that is consistent with USAA and, and our corporate responsibility, if I may just share briefly. Sure. Uh, so for USAA, um, and we love our members, so thank you for being members. Uh, USAA formed in 1922, and 100 years later, we're laser focused on our mission, military, uh, facilitating the financial security of military uh, community and their families. And so what that means is whether it's our products, our service, our, our charitable contributions, we want military families to be better. So last year, uh, we gave close to $90 million because of the impacts of uh, COVID and the impacts of racial inequity. And we also wanna make sure that our dollars, whether they are supporting uh, military families through the aid societies, or they're supporting our local communities uh, focused on food insecurity or bridging the digital divide, um, providing support for military transitions, military children, military spouses. We are focused on making military lives better and supporting the advancement of racial equality. And that's truly the beauty of these roles coming together, corporate responsibility, D, E, and I. And I think that we can continue to learn together so that lives are better for military families and our local communities. Can we make that commitment? Yeah, let's do it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything uh, new on the horizon for you at either the... USAA in general, or for the Ed Foundation, I know you you have uh, lots of work that you're doing in the DEI space. But uh, any, anything new on the horizon? I think that what I would love to share, and I think I said this a couple times, new on the horizon for us is that uh, next year we'll be celebrating USAA's 100th uh, anniversary, and uh, we are uh, remaining strong and more than ever really determining how we can better serve military families through the work that, that we do. So uh, we are continuing our elevated commitment for uh, continued support for the impacts of COVID and racial equality. And we are allowing our employees or continuing to allow our employees to give alongside USAA. Uh, last year, they gave more than 10 million of their own personal dollars and USAA matched those dollars up to 1,000, and they also volunteered 145, 150,000 hours of their time. So during our 100th anniversary celebration, we're going to find unique ways that we can continue to highlight USAA's support of military families aligned to our mission and the ways we can amplify that across the nation, and especially with um, the military families who we are so grateful and honor all that they do for our nation. So we're a hundred years looking, you know, not looking a day over whatever, you know, we're a hundred years old and, and going strong. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hey, let me say congratulations to USAA and, and uh, Air Force A Society is proud to have been partnering with USAA uh, since about 2002, and uh, you guys have donated uh, close to $5 million to us uh, during that time. And I've personally been a member since about 2004, and so collectively, uh, between myself and and uh, Air Force Aid Society, you know, we have about 35 years in that 100 uh, of, of being a good uh, teammate and, and having you guys uh, take care of us. So, so I really appreciate it. You know, Harry, one of the things that I love about you is every time we have an opportunity to work together, you always 
uh, say, hey, I want you to end with one nugget. And, uh, and so as we prepare to close, uh, you know, why don't you, uh, and, and you have so many wonderful things that you've already shared with us um, in, in about life, about leadership, about DE&I, but, you know, what would be the one uh, golden nugget or piece of advice that you would pass along to uh, our listeners here at Air Force Aid Society, the topic of your choosing? So I am going to uh, end in, in reinforcing, if I may, USAA's commitment to military families. And I want to use my career uh, trajectory as, a, as an example. I started in the call center on the phones and USAA through leadership support and through what we do as a company has grown and developed me to be in this role. USA is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. USA is committed to military families. And I believe that the experience I've had is not just unique to me. It can be everyone's experience. And these corporate programs, nonprofit programs, community programs committed to equity can make our experience more of the norm and the experience versus the exception. So uh, USA's commitment, our commitment, continue to believe in yourselves and you can be what you do see today, examples like the two of us. Absolutely. Well, again, Harry, this has been an honor, as it always is, every opportunity we get to spend time together. Uh, you have been a huge inspiration to me personally. Uh, I can tell you that, and I know you're an inspiration to uh, lots of other folks, not just at USAA, but but in the military. Uh, and on top of that, you are so graceful. That's one of the things that I really uh, love about you. So again, thank you. Thank you so much for spending time with us today and more importantly, for what you do for this nation. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I look forward to the next time I'm in San Antonio. I know we didn't get a chance to link up the last time, but next time I'm in San Antonio, uh, we have to get together and have, have that dinner. I would love that. It is a privilege and an honor to be here today. Thank you for all that you do and for your inspiration. One day, if I work hard enough, maybe I'll be just as good. <laughs> maybe. And uh, again, thank you to all the military families that are, are here and listening for all you do to, to take care of our nation. We love you. And thank you for your commitment and sacrifice. All God right. bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harriet. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, what a wonderful show it's been for us today. I, hopefully uh, you took two or three things away from uh, this discussion that Harriet and I have had about a number of things. Uh, thank you all again for supporting uh, Air Force Aid Society and USAA, and we will see you on the next podcast. Thank you. Thank you.